Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Today's celebrity lecture is very close to the heart of our museum. Dana Parker clearly shares our love of the history of the aerospace industry of Southern California and has expressed that emotion in a way that has enabled him to share his passion with us in turn. His book, Building Victory, is the ultimate expression of that passion, and we are fortunate to have him with us. But the subject, the book, and the exhaustive research that went into it, that's what you'll learn today. Ladies and gentlemen, Dana Parker. It was here, Los Angeles. America's manufacturers in World War II were engaged in the greatest industrial effort in history. Aircraft companies went from building airplanes a handful at a time to building them by the thousands in assembly lines. Aircraft manufacturing went from a sleepy 41st place amongst American industries to first place in less than five years. The Los Angeles area was the center of this Herculean achievement. Douglas Aircraft was headquartered in Santa Monica, Hughes in Culver City, Lockheed in Burbank, North American near Inglewood, Northrop in Hawthorne, and Vultee in Downey. In 1939, total aircraft production for the U.S. military was less than 3,000 planes. By the end of the war, we produced over 300,000 planes. In May of 1940, Franklin Roosevelt gave a speech in which he called for building 50,000 planes, an unheard of number at that time. Hitler's experts assured him there was no way America was going to produce that many planes. His experts were wrong. Donald Douglas, president of Douglas Aircraft, heard the same speech. His reaction was different. He said, we can do this. And do it, they did. There has been no other six-year period in history when so many airplanes were produced. Production doubled and redoubled. Production of machine tools tripled and retripled. Manufacturer for manufacturer, factory for factory, worker for worker, America outproduced its enemies. No war was more industrialized than World War II. It was a war that was won as much by machine shops as by machine guns. Despite the massive buildup, an inexperienced workforce, and the inevitable inefficiencies caused by shifting from civilian to military production, productivity actually increased. Productivity in the aircraft industry doubled between 1941 and 1944. The American aircraft worker produced more than twice his or her counterpart in Germany and Japan, and four times the average Japanese worker. Who were these American workers? Largely women. After losing thousands of employees to military service, American manufacturers hired women to the point where the typical aircraft plant's production force was 40% female. In the First World War, the government had taken over the nation's congested railroads. It didn't solve the congestion problem, and in some ways made it even worse. In the Second World War, Roosevelt resisted the New Deal urge for an industrial takeover. There was rationing of strategic materials, but by and large, 
the government let business do what business does best, produce. The profit motive proved to be a more effective incentive for production than government edicts would have been. In Germany, the Nazi generals directed manufacturing efforts, and they changed their minds often. Germany's poor productivity was a reflection of this. American manufacturers responded to the surging demand for military goods with unheard of alacrity. Even Joseph Stalin, the leader of world communism, praised American production, quote, without which this war would have been lost. The United States not only armed its own forces, but its allies as well. From a nearly standing start, the U.S. produced an average of 170 planes a day, more than the Soviet Union and Great Britain combined. This industrial accomplishment ranks amongst America's greatest achievements. In World War II, America built an air armada that was the greatest striking force any nation had ever built. As Donald Douglas observed, here's proof that free men can outproduce slaves. Where was the center of this remarkable achievement? It was here. How do you go from producing airplanes a couple of dozen at a time to producing them by the hundreds or the thousands? Here's how. This is a diagram of the Douglas plant in Santa Monica. In designing such a plant, the aircraft engineer has a challenge. You want to do several things simultaneously. One thing is you have to have the parts made to great precision. That's, that's the essence of the Industrial Revolution, interchangeable parts. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, if you wanted to buy a flintlock rifle, for example, it was made individually. The Industrial Revolution said, no, no, no. We need to make the parts interchangeable and to very precise uh, tolerances plus or minus a few thousandths of an inch, even on something as large as an airplane wing. The other thing you have to do is the tricky thing called balancing the line. You want an assembly line to produce airplanes? You want to make each workstation's work take the same amount of time so you don't have bottlenecks. And ideally, you design your aircraft plant so that a boxcar full of raw materials comes into one side and goes in a straight line to a finished airplane coming out the door on the other side with no backtracking, no cross-handling of materials, all smooth, nicely balanced production line. Not as easy as it might sound because different functions in producing an airplane take different amounts of time. Well, how do you solve that? You can add more labor, but that's not always easy because you can't squeeze too many people into one workspace, can you? Well, the engineers at the Douglas plant figured out several clever solutions. One, in building the fuselage of the plane, the center of the plane, they split it down the middle like the two halves of a hot dog bun. Now you can have people working on the outside of this half as well as the inside, and the outside of the other half as well as the inside. Get as many workers on that piece of production as you can at the same time. And in addition to that, they even made two parallel lines for the fuselage, which is a time-consuming portion of producing the plane, which you can see here. At the lower center of the picture there, you have the beginnings of two fuselage lines with the two halves of the hot dog bun moving that direction, and then the center wing section comes in from the side, that gets assembled, and then the airplane comes back down the other side of the building, looking more and more like an airplane as it finally works its way out the other end of the plant. Here's a picture of one of the ends of that production line, showing you how the, the two halves of the, the fuselage are together there. This is Donald Douglas's first plane. This is the Cloudster, made out of wood, built right here in Southern California in a building in downtown Los Angeles, the Cole, K-O-L-L, planing mill, 
building still there, by the way, on Colleton Street in Los Angeles. And if you look very closely up at the top of this brick building, in faded paint, you can still see the word coal. And that company still exists. It's still a, a real estate development firm. This is Douglas's first plant in Santa Monica. That uh, lonely looking street in the foreground is Wilshire Boulevard. <laughs> Rather expensive piece of real estate now, isn't it? That's 26th and Wilshire right there. And prior to Douglas, that was a movie studio. There's a nice picture of Donald Douglas. By the way, they thought originally they were going to take the planes and, and fly them off the dirt lot next to the, the building there. Didn't work as well as they thought. And so they, they tractored them down Cloverfield Boulevard to what is now Santa Monica Airport. Then it was referred to as Clover Field, which, by the way, is not named after the plant clover, the four-leaf clover. It's named after a person named Clover. This is riveting. Riveting is typically a two-person job. You have the riveter and the bucker. The bucker is holding the bucking bar, which is a little miniature anvil, handheld anvil, which is used to form the other head, or the, the butt, of the rivet. The riveter and the bucker typically can't see each other because of the skin of the airplane, and oftentimes in those times could not hear each other either because of the noise of the aircraft plant. So what did they do? They developed tapping signals. Typically, the riveter would put the rivet in the hole and hold the rivet gun against it, and then when he felt the bucking, the bucker put the bucking bar against it, once he felt that, then he would pound for a while until he thought it was enough, stop, and then the bucker, instead of trying to call out to him, would tap. One tap usually meant, that's good. Two taps, hit it some more. Three taps, whoops, we messed this up, we're gonna to have to drill it out. The Douglas plant in Santa Monica, unfortunately, didn't have its own rail spur, which is something you would want in an aircraft factory. You want to be able to get your raw materials in by rail, which is cheaper than by truck. So they, they used what was in those days called a team track. It's called a team track because that's where you brought your team of horses and your wagon up to a public track that you could then unload your boxcar. The railroad industry still uses the word team track today, by the way. This was on near Cloverfield Boulevard, the sunset siding. They're loading their materials onto a truck for, to tall it a couple of blocks across town to the Douglas plant on Ocean Park Boulevard. Those are airplane engines, by the way, in those boxes. This is the end of the assembly line. That's an A20, just about done. The plant sloped downhill slightly towards the ocean, as land in Southern California typically does. They took advantage of that. When the airplane is finally finished to the point where it can roll on its own gear, it's rolling downhill. This is perhaps the most important machine tool in the aircraft factory. This is a drop hammer, the ubiquitous drop hammer. It's used for forming sheet metal into a curved shape in what's called a deep draw operation. You lift the hammer up, by the use of that revolving drum at the top with the ropes around it, the operator is cinching up the rope on the revolving drum. He's not turning the motor on and off. The motor runs continuously. What he does is he cinches the rope up to give it enough friction to grab. It then lifts the hammer up. He has a, a, a mechanism he can use to hold it up there while he changes out the work. And then he can let it fall into a a die. You have a female half of the die, the concave portion, and the male half, which comes together with a piece of sheet metal in between and forms the shape that you want. He can also snub the rope enough to control the speed. Very handy machine. As you can imagine, drop hammers were not only noisy, but they also made a lot of vibration. And typically, aircraft plants would put them in a separate building. <laughs> You don't want it pounding the floor and knocking all your jigs and fixtures out of alignment. They oftentimes even had a separate foundation just for the drop hammer. This was the email system in 1942. <laughs> yes, they are wearing roller skates. If you want to get those blueprints from one end of the plant to the other, 
and the Santa Monica plant was about four blocks long. This is how you did it. And yes, they moved fast, so you got out of their way. This is Opportunity Day. Here you have a, a riveter and her bucker. What's the message to those interested ladies in the crowd? The message is, you can do this. And as you can see, some of them look a little bit skeptical. This is the Douglas plant in Santa Monica. Take a look at this picture. Note the area behind the plant, that large open area. And now look at the next picture. This is the same plant taken from the other direction, by the way. The plant is underneath what looks like that residential neighborhood. What you're seeing that looks like an aircraft plant is a dummy plant. And what looks like Santa Monica Airport there is a fake airport. This was to disguise it from Japanese airplanes. After Pearl Harbor, we quite rightly assumed that we're next. If they can sneak up on Hawaii, they can sneak up on us, or the Panama Canal, or Alaska. The West Coast was very much thought to be the next target. This is the roof. Yes, those are fake streets, fake buildings made out of burlap, chicken wire, chicken feathers, and plywood. And what looks like a nice rolling hill in the background is actually the Douglas hangar. This is underneath the camouflage. Who do you think Douglas got to do the camouflage work? Warner Brothers Studios. And after they did the job, they went back to their studios and thought, our buildings look an awful lot like an aircraft factory. <laughs> and they camouflaged their own studios. There's another shot. And yes, that thing that looks like a blimp is a barrage balloon. This is close to where we are. That's Los Angeles International Airport on the right there. This view is looking west towards the ocean in the background. That's Aviation Boulevard in the foreground. And that's uh, Imperial Highway running up and down in the picture. So on the right there, you have the North American plant, Aviation and Imperial. Next is Interstate Aviation. Next is the Douglas El Segundo plant. This is what aircraft production looked like before the war. Notice this is not the same kind of production line, is it? Here the planes are kind of scattered almost haphazardly in the building. Why is that? It's because a big order for airplanes in those times was a couple of dozen planes. If you got an order of that big, it's like, whoa, wee, this is great, we got a huge order. Two dozen airplanes. And so there's no reason to set up an expensive production line to build a, a small order of planes like that. The worker went to the work instead of the other way around. And as much as 25% of the worker's time was spent moving his tools to the plane and then back again, and equipment and parts and scaffolding and whatnot. So setting up a production line was more efficient but it was also a huge capital investment that wasn't worth it if you're only building a couple of dozen planes. Here's a production line. This is El Segundo, the Douglas plant there. Those are SBD Dauntless dive bombers. And yes, they move sideways down the production line. As most of you probably know, that's the plane that uh, won the Battle of Midway, sank four Japanese carriers in one day. This is riveting without a bucker. This is a riveting machine. For small assemblies, this is a, a handy way to do it. For one thing, you don't need the bucker. And two, it's faster. You also don't need as many of those things that you can see that look like little spark plugs there. Those are Clico clips, which is a spring-loaded device which keeps the, the work in alignment while you're trying to rivet it. Because no matter how careful you are in riveting, it's going to distort the metal a little bit. And by the time you get to the end of the row of rivets, they might not line up anymore. So that's what the Clico clips do, is it keeps the work in alignment while you're busy trying to rivet it. This is the engineering department at El Segundo. Every part, every jig, every fixture began as a mark on a piece of paper with a 2-H pencil. And there were an awful lot of pieces of paper and a lot of pencils in that room. This is Douglas in Long Beach. 
By now, the threat of an air raid on the west coast has diminished, so the camouflage is gone. But if you look closely at the roof, you can still see the remnants of, of streets laid out on top of the roof, so the buildings there. Those buildings were built separately, deliberately designed, so that if you blew up one of them, it might not spread the fire to the entire facility. Douglas, in this case, learned from the Santa Monica example. Here they not only have their own rail spur, they have their own railroad yard. And as you know, most of that plant is now gone, but there is one building that still exists. That uh, hangar building is still there at the top of the facility right next to the tarmac of Long Beach Airport. And if you look closely, those little dots on the hill behind, on Signal Hill, those are oil rigs. This is the Douglas plant in Long Beach. And yes, when you're building an aircraft plant, the first thing you do is build the rail spur. It not only helps you bring in raw materials, but it also helps you bring in building materials, as well as the machine tools that you need for the plant. And that's a gondola car, which is very handy. You can put anything in a gondola, no matter how huge it is. This is inside the plant. Those are C-47s, which is essentially the same thing as a DC-3, the famous DC-3. Remarkable airplane. There are still hundreds of DC-3s flying in the world in revenue service, in commercial service. The C-47 was modified slightly. They added a big door, as which you can see there. That's capable of accepting a Jeep through that door. They also reinforced the floor. But interestingly enough, they kept the square windows on the fuselage. Why you need those to haul a jeep around, I don't know. But I suppose maybe the paratroopers on D-Day appreciated the chance to look out the window. This is the parts department of Long Beach. Isn't that huge? Awful lot of parts. This is the largest airplane built. This is the, the Hughes Spruce Goose, so-called, although Howard Hughes hated that name. For one thing, it was made out of birch. Wingspan larger than that of a modern 747. It was also built out of wood in one of the largest wooden buildings ever built, next to the longest private runway ever built, about 9,000 feet long, the Hughes Runway in Culver City. There she is, seeing daylight for the first time, on her way to Long Beach. For some of you longtime residents, you might remember the pontoon bridge that went to Terminal Island. There she is, and there's the Spruce Goose going across it. That bridge was replaced uh, by a suspension bridge, or I guess it's more of a truss bridge. Um, let's see, that's the Gerald Desmond Bridge, if I recall correctly. I, never, I always get the bridges mixed up. And as you can see in the background, there are some of Long Beach's oil derricks. The airplane was hauled down there in pieces and assembled on Terminal Island. You can see the wings and the fuselage and so on. If you look at the top of the picture, there's the pontoon bridge on the top right. That power plant is still there, by the way, just to the left of that. And to the left of that, just out of the picture, was the California Shipbuilding Corporation's shipyard, where they built thousands of Liberty ships. And Henry Kaiser, who owned a, an interest in CalShip, was dismayed at the sinkings of those Liberty ships. And that's what made him start to think, we need to find a way to build an unsinkable Liberty ship to get supplies to England. What's the best way to do that? Fly it. The U-boats can't sink the Spruce Goose, can they? And so that's where the idea came from. There she is. And as you recall, the Spruce Goose is a seaplane. And what they're building here is a graving dock, a type of dry dock that's built into the land. That, you can see that steam bucket finishing it up there. It's actually three, one for the fuselage and one on each side for the pontoons under the wings. There's Howard Hughes checking things out before the first taxiing tests. There he is, pilot in command. There's the Spruce Goose. Those of you might re remember, this was the Rainbow Pier in Long Beach. 
you ever saw the movie, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, there was a scene in that movie where the, the automobiles are chasing each other around that pier. Inside the center of that pier was the bathhouse, and to the left at the top there was the pike, the amusement park, and also just above the Rainbow Pier in the picture, above the bathhouse, is a building which is still there, the Breakers, tall skyscraper right there on Shoreline Drive, I think it is, in Long Beach. And at the top of that building on the cupola were two machine gun nests, one of which is still there. The, machine's gun. the machine gun is no longer in it. Howard Hughes did not have a flight plan filed that day. He invited the press to come down, but he told them, we're just going to do taxi tests. And then on the third one, he pulled the throttle back, and up they went. And they flew for about a mile. And that was the last time that plane flew, the only time it flew. And when it was over, the government, which owned the plane, would have scrapped it into matchsticks because the war was over by the time Howard Hughes finished it. Hughes, who had put years of his life into this plane, had an option in the contract to lease it back from the government if they didn't need it. He exercised the option. He built the world's first climate-controlled hangar specifically for the plane, and he kept it there for the next 30 years until he died. He had an initial workforce there of 300 people, mechanics and security guards, to keep that plane airworthy the entire time. He built the building, he hired all those people, he paid rent to the port for the real estate. It cost him a million dollars a year. And the plane still exists, as some of you know, in a museum up near Portland. This is Lockheed in Burbank. That's the uh, Union Pacific Railroad on the lower right there, and next to it is what used to be their dirt airstrip. And as you can see at this point, they're using it to park airplanes. There's a P-38 Lightning, perhaps one of Lockheed's most famous planes, wonderful airplane. There's a P-38 coming off the uh, final assembly line there, being lifted off of its rolling jig. This is one of the advantages of the P-38. The Mustang, which is the other famous fighter of the war, had a single engine in the center and the machine guns out on the wings, which of course means that the machine guns then don't fire straight ahead, they fire into a convergence zone. The P-38, it doesn't need a convergence zone because the engines are out on the wings and the pilot is in the center, in a center nacelle, along with the firepower. So those guns shoot straight ahead which can be a deadly advantage in combat. This is probably an unusual picture. This man is draft age. When the war began, the government, naturally, was looking for soldiers. They drafted people out of the aircraft plants, and a lot of people volunteered out of the aircraft plants, which presents a bit of a problem to the aircraft manufacturer. You're not only being asked to increase your production from 20 airplanes to 200 or 2,000 or more. Now, your skilled employees who you thought you were going to use to train all of these hundreds and thousands of new employees, they're disappearing on you. They're going into military service. How do you do that? What an industrial challenge. Think of whatever profession you're in. And Pretend that somebody comes to you and says, by the way, we need you to double your production and then double it again and double it again. And by the way, we're going to draft half of your employees. Well, the aircraft companies finally went to the government and said, you're going to have to decide. Do you want us to provide you with soldiers or airplanes? And the government wisely completely reversed its policy and said, not only are we going to stop drafting employees with critical skills, we won't even let them enlist. If they try to exist, we will send the FBI down there and drag them back. <laughs> and so here's an employee, a machinist with a critical skill. I love this picture. 
Some of you probably know who this is. That's Orville Wright. If I recall correctly, he's 72 years old in this picture. This is his last flight. It's on a constellation, those famous planes with the three tails, which, by the way, Howard Hughes influenced a TWA to buy and Lockheed to build. I love the picture because of the look on his face. Here's the man that invented the airplane. And at the age of 72, the delight of flight obviously hasn't left him. That was his last flight. He died not too long after that. Many of the women that came to work in the aircraft plants came because of the pay. They could make double or maybe triple or even four times as much money working on an aircraft assembly line than they could working in a department store. A lot of them came to California thinking they were going to get into Hollywood. But most of them had another reason. They had family members in the service. And for them, every rivet that they set was their way of getting their loved one home quicker. And this lady here has been sent a captured Japanese flag by her son in the Pacific. These are wiring harnesses. They're held together with string, by the way, not uh, little plastic clips. This was a way of expediting the production line by doing some of this work ahead of time so you could install the whole harness at once. But there were still possibilities for the occasional error. So oftentimes, the delivery pilot who was taking the plane from the plant to the, to the military, usually oftentimes a female, by the way, would find that, whoops, the controls were vice versa. <laughs> so you could still make a mistake even with a wiring harness. In hiring people who weren't used to working in aircraft plants, such as females who might have had responsibilities at home, Absenteeism increased dramatically, and so did turnover. People weren't used to the, the hard physical labor. And some plants had 100% turnover in a year. And to combat this, they did everything they could think of. They hired women counselors to help the, the new employees get used to working in a male-dominated environment to resolve those kinds of problems, and help them with finding childcare and paying their bills, just the, the difficulty. How do you get to the post office if you're working six days a week? It's not always easy, is it? One of the other things that they did was have entertainment at lunchtime. They'd bring bands in to help entertain the employees. And as you can see from the expression on this company nurse's face, I think she's enjoying the show. In addition to hiring females, they hired kids. High school students would go to school in the morning, go to work in the aircraft plant in the afternoon. Although I kind of wonder if this kid might have fibbed a bit about his age. <laughs> he looks like a pretty young high school student to me. And that's a nice picture of a Tleco clip, by the way. And that little tool that he has in his hand that looks like a pair of pliers is a device to apply the Tleco clips to compress the spring. These are Lockheed's Hudson bombers, just before America entered the war. They're shipping them off to England, right here in the port. The airplane has been cocooned. It has a protective covering on it with some canvas and probably cosmoline or something, so it can survive the ocean voyage to get to England. The wings have already been stowed below deck. And I'm sure there were probably some colorful conversations between the chief mate on that vessel and the stevedoring superintendent on exactly how this thing was going to be stowed. This is shift change in Burbank at Lockheed. And if you look closely, you don't see a whole lot of male draft age faces in that photograph. This is another important machine tool. This is a shear. It works like a big paper cutter for cutting sheet metal. And those arms that stick out next to the worker have stops on them which can be made so that you can pull the piece of sheet metal back to the stop and produce multiple cuttings of the same exact size. Very handy machine in an aircraft factory. This is another handy machine that you don't see too often in machine shops anymore. This is a planer. 
It's used for producing a flat surface, a plane or a groove. Instead of the tool moving, that entire table moves back and forth, and it might be 10 feet long. So you could line up a whole series of engine blocks or other castings that you want to all plane at once, and that whole table slides underneath the cutting tool, and then the cutting tool will move left and right as needed. This is Lockheed and Burbank. Those are P-38 Lightnings, one of the most important fighters of the war. First plane to fly 400 miles an hour, by the way. Here you have two parallel production lines, both doing the same thing. This is the same building later. Here they went to a mechanized production line, continuously moving. On the right of the photograph, the planes move um, from the rear of the building to the front and then they shift over sideways and move in that center line backwards, and then they shift over again and move forward again towards the camera. They converted that entire plant to this mechanized line in only eight days. And during that time period, production never ceased. It was continued outdoors. Well, son of a gun, that's a B-25 Mitchell bomber. This is North American's plant right here next to LA Airport, Inglewood. And those are parallel production lines of the final assembly on the right. And on the left, underneath that white uh, structure, that's, those are fuselages being built. And the wings, were, the outer wings, were added to the aircraft outdoors on the sunshine assembly line. Which brings up an interesting question problem for the manufacturer, because this is Southern California, where the sun shines nice and bright. What happens to metal when it warms up in the sun? It expands. So it must have been an interesting challenge to get that outer wing put on there before the fuselage section, the center wing, heats up to the point where it no longer fits. This is the North American plant in uh, 1941 when there was a strike. There were a lot more strikes in those times than we have today. There were hundreds and hundreds of strikes, which was very vexing to Franklin Roosevelt, who was a supporter of organized labor. But it, this one in particular finally drove him nuts to the point where he said, we cannot have this. And he sent in the army with bayonets fixed to break up those picket lines and force those picketers away from the plant so that those who wanted to come to work could do so. This is hanging an engine. That's a chain hoist that that man is operating. It's a handy little device. You have a loop of chain going around a gear, which then controls the other chain, which actually does the lifting. So you have a great mechanical advantage. You don't need power to lift something very heavy, even an aircraft engine. You can do it with one person. What he has in his other hand is the electrical controls for the trolley, which move the chain hoist along a rail at the top of the building so that it can move left and right. But the actual lifting is done by him. I love this picture. These are the people that built these planes. Here you have an old man, a machinist, who under any other circumstances would have been retired by now. But because of the war, he stays on. And who's he training? This young lady. Is she going to gain all of the tremendous machining knowledge that's in his head in the short time period she has available? No. But she'll learn enough, and she'll learn fast. And she will be able to operate something even as complicated as a turret lathe, which is what she's learning how to operate here. She'll do her job well. This is a press brake, another very handy tool in an aircraft factory. It's not just skin that makes an airplane. You have longitudinal members which take that stress, the beams, the longer ons, and, and so on. And typically, they're made out of sheet metal that's formed into that shape rather than purchased. They form it right there in the shop. And this is the tool that'll do it. It'll take a flat piece of metal, and that upper bar will come down and form it into an angle or a channel or a corrugated piece, whatever you need for your airplane. Aircraft workers had a sense of humor. This is 
what happens when your supplier falls a little bit behind. Maybe you don't get the tires in that you need to finish up the airplane. Well, you don't want to shut down the production line, so what do you do? You make something out of whatever you have available, such as wood. You make a wooden wheel so you can roll that thing out of the plant and make room for the next one to come off the line. Where does the sense of humor come in? If you look very closely at this picture, scrawled on the side of that wooden wheel are the words, do not inflate. <laughs> These are P-51 Mustangs, which many people would argue was the greatest fighter of the war. Some people would say it was the greatest fighter of all time, produced right here at Inglewood, North American. As you can see, there are so many of them that they're spilling off the tarmac onto the dirt. And you think, well, that's a lot of planes. That's only a few days' production. If you look very closely on the right side of the photo, in the background, you can see the camouflaged plant there through the fog. There's another nice picture of a Mustang. That's the main line of the Santa Fe Railway going to the harbor in the background. These are P-61s, the Black Widow, Northrop's famous Black Widow built right here in Hawthorne. I love this picture. It really shows off the sheet metal worker's art. Look at the reflection on that plane, on those wings. What a perfectly reflected surface that is. That's a precisely made surface. There she is in flight over Palos Verdes. Nice picture. And yes, it's not a coincidence that they were painted black. They were meant to fight at night to protect England in the Blitz and so on. That was the idea for that plane. And they did experiments and found, yes, painting it black is the best way to have a, what we would call a stealth airplane. There's a nice picture of Jack Northrup in the, in the foreground on the left there as a young man. And right behind him, inside the fuselage, is Jerry Volte, who later went on to found his own aircraft company as well. Northrop was the first one to have family day. Let the families come down and look at the production line. This was their first plane. They started off as a subcontractor building parts for other subassemblies and so on for other aircraft companies. And then they built this seaplane for Norway. That's Lake Elsinore where it's being tested. They trucked the parts out there and built them. They assembled it right there on the beach at Lake Elsinore. There's one of Jack Northrop's famous flying wings. There they are in flight over Muroc Army Air Base, which is now Edwards Air Force Base. Muroc, by the way, was named that after the Coram family, which owned the land. They had homesteaded there. And they were going to have a post office, so where do you, what do you name the post office? Well, you name it after the, the landowner, right? Except there was already a Coram post office in California, so they spelled the name backwards, Muroc. <laughs> This is Volte in Downey, and no, there are no orange groves growing there today. Uh, and most of that building now has been demolished, raised, although they kept the front portion, which is still there. The back portion is becoming a shopping mall. I guess that says something about California. These are Volte workers building a BT-13, which we happen to have outside the, the hangar here in front of us. It's made not out of aluminum. They wanted to keep the aluminum for building more critical uh, airplanes in the war than, than trainers. So they made it out of tubular steel, which was also handy because it's a little more rugged than aluminum is. And if you're training new pilots, that ruggedness come in, comes in handy sometimes. There's their production line. Volte was the first one to have a mechanized production line. And they were also the first one to hire women in large numbers. This gives you an idea of the size of the plant. As you can see, they hired a variety of people who they might not otherwise have considered for employment, not just women, but little people as well. And those little people came in handy working in tight quarters. This is a, another interesting machine tool. This is the Farnham Roll. It works kind of like the ringer on an old-fashioned washing machine. It's another way of forming sheet metal into shapes. It actually had three rolls, so you could form curved shapes, you could even form a cone by adjusting the distance apart of the 
one end or the other of the rolls. Not only did Rosie the Riveter build airplanes, but so did Wendy the Welder. Here she is working on an exhaust manifold. Volte was very happy to hire women because they found that, by golly, the women on one shift had a tendency to look at the production of the women on the previous shift or the men on the previous shift and decide, we can beat this. No wonder they were happy to hire women. This is how you form the dies for your, uh, your deep drawing operation, for your drop hammer. The dies were typically made out of a zinc compound called kirksite. That was the brand name that was commonly used. You poured it in to a mold. And then, uh, if you were lucky, you did this without spilling too much of the molten zinc onto your pants in the process. And then they typically poured lead into the cooled female half of the dye to form the male half of the dye. And the lead uh, would shrink a little bit as it dried, and that would give enough room for the work. Los Angeles was not only the home of aircraft manufacturers, but also aircraft engine manufacturers. This is Manasco. Manasco was one of the largest aircraft manufacturers in the country. And they made an interesting engine. The engine was upside down. It was inverted. You had the spark plugs on the bottom, and you had the crankshaft on the top. This gave a couple of advantages. One, it gave more ground clearance for the propeller. And two, it gave the pilot better visibility. This is Manasco's machine shop. In the foreground, you see relatively modern machine tools for the time. They're operated by electricity. Each one has its own individual motor with electrical conduit coming down from the ceiling. But if you look closely in the background, there's an old time machine shop. Up on the top is a line shaft with pulleys on it. And instead of electrical conduit coming down to each machine, you had a wide, flat leather belt coming down to the machines, which didn't have their own motors. They were all powered by the line shaft overhead, which was powered by one motor or one steam engine. This was the way machine shops started out. And this, as you can see, it's still being used in, even in the 40s. This is an aircraft engine crankshaft mounted on a lathe for the final turning of the journals. If you look closely, inside each journal is a hole. Why? To lighten the part. You wouldn't go to that trouble on a stationary engine or a marine application engine. That's something you'd only bother to do on an aircraft engine. Here's the Manasco testing department and some well-lubricated mechanics pouring engine oil or something into that engine with the propeller running. That looks pretty safe, don't you think? This is the inside of the test booth with all those sophisticated dials on that piece of plywood there. This is a company in Santa Monica, a machine shop, which goes to show something about the ingenuity of the time. There were thousands of machine shops across the country producing parts for the aircraft manufacturers, which prior to the war, the word subcontractor wasn't even used in the aircraft industry. They made everything themselves. During the war, they subcontracted everything they could think of to machine shops all across the country. Here's an example of some of the ingenuity prompted by the wartime shortages. This company decided they needed a sheet metal shear. Unfortunately, the machine tool manufacturers had a two-year backlog. So the company had an engineer on the staff who was a pretty sharp guy. He said, well, we could make a shear. And the president of the company said, really? He said, sure. And they not only made their shear, but they found that, by golly, the foundries were all backlogged. They couldn't get castings. So they designed and manufactured their own shear out of nothing but steel plate. That entire machine is made of steel plate, which they could get. And then, after they made it, the president of the company went to some of his buddies and showed it off. He said, look what we just made in our own shop. And one of the other companies that also needed a shear said, I'll buy it from you. <laughs>
and they made him an offer that was too good to refuse. So they sold it, made two more, sold them, made a half a dozen more, sold them. And the first thing you know, they're in the shear manufacturing business. That's, and that story is, is emblematic of what happened in the war. This is a man named Reginald Denny, who was a movie actor, relatively famous in the 30s, 40s. What he isn't famous for, but probably should be, is he was the father of the radio-controlled drone. And here's his production line, which goes to show that even a relatively small business can come up with a relatively sophisticated method for producing the product. As you can see, all of those workbenches are at the perfect height. They connect with each other so you can roll the product down the assembly line. They could make 400 drones a week, if I recall correctly. They had some interesting engineering learning experiences in the testing process. In other words, failures where the drone would crash. So they decided, you know what? This is an expensive way to test our product. Let's find a better way. So they utilized a sturdy Packard motor car and a nice flat dry lake bed out in the Mojave Desert to test their radio controls on their drones. And this is one of their workers at Radio Plane, which, by the way, was later taken over by Northrop. This was one of their workers whose job was to help assemble the drones as well as pack the parachutes in them. Pretty sophisticated drone. They had parachutes so that when the military shot it down, they could recover at least some of the darn thing. They needed somebody for some publicity shots, and so they, they picked her. And in the process, she was told, you know what? you should think about going into modeling. And by golly, sure enough, she did. And her hair color changed to blonde, and her name changed also to Marilyn Monroe. And on that, I will now be happy to take some of your questions. This gentleman said that of all the B-17s flying today, every single one of them was built in Long Beach. And that brings up an interesting point too, sir because the B-17 is not a Douglas plane, is it? It's a Boeing plane. Why are they building them in a Douglas plant in Long Beach? This goes to show some of the amazing cooperation between the aircraft companies during the war. These are, these are private businesses. They, what do private businesses do? They compete with each other. Rightly so. That's what makes free enterprise work, right? That's the What's made the Industrial Revolution so successful is the, the competition between private businesses to produce a better product or a better price. During the war, Donald Douglas, realizing that we have to get these planes in the air as fast as we can, any way that we can, got together with the other aircraft manufacturers on the West Coast, and they agreed amongst themselves to not only share each other's products. They licensed each other's products back and forth at no charge, by the way. So Douglas could build a Boeing plane. If it had the plant space, if it felt it had the ability, it would build a Boeing plane. And Boeing built Douglas planes in Washington. They even shared machine time. If, if you're the plant manager here in, in Long Beach, and your, your drop hammers are backlogged, and you go to the vault team manager in, in Downey and say, can you help me out? And he says, yeah, we're, we're caught up on our drop hammer work. I've got a couple of weeks ahead of time on drop hammer work. I'll do some of your work for you. And they would trade machine time with each other. They would trade parts with each other. One way to fix that tire shortage, see if somebody else has some tires. Maybe he got his shipment in. Maybe he's a couple of days ahead on tires. He can help you out. They even shared engineering knowledge. In one instance, I think it was Douglas had knowledge of how to build dive brakes from the SBD Dauntless dive bomber, which had uh, interesting perforated dive brakes on the wings. I, if I recall correctly, it was Volte that was going to build something that needed dive brakes. And so they went to Douglas and said, can you help us out on some of the engineering knowledge that you have on dive brakes? And Douglas said, sure. 
no charge. And Douglas's comment afterwards was that they saved him six months of engineering time, and that was six months gained on Hitler. And yet they knew after the war, they would all go back to being fierce competitors again, which is what makes business work, right? Most of the aircraft companies during the war not only expanded their original plants, but also built new plants from scratch, which is another interesting development. Uh, to think that you could go from a bare piece of dirt to an aircraft plant quickly enough to influence the war. How do you do that? How do you design and build an aircraft factory from scratch? Um, some of them were quite successful at it. Some of them were not so successful. Um, it was thought prior to the war that it would be easy for the automobile companies to convert their automobile plants into aircraft plants. And it turned out to be not quite as easy as they thought. Building an airplane is different from building an automobile. And without meaning to sound uh, condescending towards automobile companies, um, I'll repeat one quote, which I believe was from a Dutch Kindleberger at North American. And he said, after it took Ford Motor Company 18 months at their famous uh, plant to build Liberator bombers, B-24s, 18 months later, they still hadn't even produced a single part. And Kindleberger comes along and says, well, this goes to show what, it, what happens when you try to teach a blacksmith how to build a watch. <laughs> so anyway, it, it took Ford Motor Company a little longer than they thought to get up and running to build an airplane. Eventually, they were successful and very successful at building Liberator bombers, but it took a while. This gentleman said that his father um, worked in New Jersey, he said, as a, as a photographer during the war. And they would fly the planes to New Jersey from the manufacturing plant and then disassemble them and take pictures of the plane being disassembled and put them in a book in reverse order so that they could then reassemble them on the other side. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.